am going to try to convince you that at this moment, the, co the convergence of technology and psychology and new developments in cognitive science give us reason to completely rethink education. Because for most of our time on this planet, learning was about acquiring new content. You have that fire thing. I like that. I want some. Teach me how to do the fire thing. Well, that's great, but it turns out that learning is also about change. So when we give something somebody new, like this car key, for example, well, it's a car key to me because I grew up in the old days when cars had keys. And you'd take them out of your pocket and you'd put them in the thing and you'd turn it. So what do I do with this new technology, this new bit of content? I treat it like a car key. I take it out of my pocket and I get into the car and I go, where do I put it? Because there's this button that doesn't need a key. So that for old people, you may have noticed that some of these car companies are now making a little plastic rectangle so that you can put your non-car key there and rest it. Because <laughs> what I'm doing is throwing it in the cup holder or in the next seat because the problem is not this new piece of content you've tried to teach me, it's that I'm still thinking of it like a car key. It's not a car key! It's a personal identity device. They should have made it a wristband. So after two years of doing this, I finally realized I can leave it in my pocket and just go, open sesame, and the car opens. <laughs> and I get in because the car knows who I am. So the problem was not the new piece of thing that you tried to teach me, the problem was that I was still using the same old categories. I wasn't changing what I was doing. So change is hard. Human beings are not very good at this. And it's gotten worse because technology has changed our relationship to knowledge. So again, back in the old days when I was in school, if you wanted to know something, you went to this strange thing called the encyclopedia. And there was stuff, there was knowledge and content in there. It wasn't perfect. And you had to go to the library or some other place, not your pocket, to get this information. So it wasn't perfect, but there were no cat videos in the encyclopedia. <laughs> so in those days, content and knowledge was relatively scarce, but fairly reliable. Now we have the opposite problem. Now you have access to all of the Library of Congress and all the Beethoven manuscripts on your phone, so knowledge is abundant. But it's mostly cat videos. <laughs> it's not very reliable. So the problem of education has shifted from, here's how to use the card catalog, and you can find more encyclopedias and more knowledge, to here's a device that's full of content, but it's mostly junk. You need to figure out what's important, what's relevant, what's true. So that's a radically different situation for students today than when we were in school. And we're so confused about this that we don't even know what smart is anymore. And we think this is a smartphone, but it's not smart. Smart is the ability to change your mind. When you get a car key, that you don't keep using it like a car key. That is smart, the ability to change when you get new things. And so we're confused about that. It also turns out that most of what you're going to have to do when you graduate, we don't know. We can't teach you that knowledge because it hasn't been invented yet. It hasn't been discovered. So this chart was done by a couple of professors looking at what majors are most likely to be useless in 10 years. Now, they don't know, they haven't been to the future, but there are lots of predictions, and this one says that accounting and finance is the major most likely to be useless, because it's math and algorithms and robots or some AI will do that. They don't know, and we hear statistics, you know, 50%, 60% of the jobs of the future haven't yet been invented. It's true. I have a daughter in New York, when she was in her young 20s, she was a director of social media, because every 24-year-old should be a director. But a few years ago, there was no such thing as social media. And now you can direct it. <laughs> so what will they be directing in 10 years? We don't know. Educators don't know. I can't teach you this. You think a computer science degree is useful? Sure it's useful. It's a degree in the iPhone 1. 
or the 10 maybe, because we don't know what the 25 is yet, it hasn't been invented. You will have to adapt and learn to change when the iPhone 25 comes out. So to do that, we have to rethink how we think about curriculum. So curriculum is like a toolbox. Physics is like a hammer, and poetry is like a screwdriver. You kind of need them all because you don't know when you graduate if you're going to be given nails or screws. So that gold-plated hammer that you spent four years on, that's fine, unless they give you screws in the new job. <laughs> so we need students to be able to rethink your major matters less than it ever did. The ability to change matters more. So you remember the old three R's? Content, reading, writing, arithmetic. The new three R's need to be about process. We need to help students prepare for the unknown. Our job as teachers is to make ourselves obsolete so that you no longer need us, that you can learn new things on your own, things that I don't know, because I don't know them. They haven't yet been invented. So the three R's of process are relationships, resilience, and reflection. Relationships being the most important of those, because it turns out as human beings, we think in communities. We, we're more likely to believe evidence from people that we think like us or that we like them. Ask any car salesman, right? Getting you to like me means you're going to believe me more, right? And we, if I don't like your group or what you stand for, I don't like that evidence, right? We actually don't think alone. We think in communities. So relationships, and we're designed to, do, to assess everything for threat. Your amygdala at the back of your brain goes, ah, no, that's bad, run, right? It's better safe than sorry, fight or flight. I don't want to learn that, right? So, so relationships are actually the antidote to all of that understanding and thinking in communities. But resilience also matters. The best teacher in the world is the tennis net because it provides Instant feedback without judgment. <laughs> As teachers, we should all strive to be like the tennis net. Because if there's no tennis net, it's like, wow, I am so good at this. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. I'm going to win. Let's go to Wimbledon. But the failure is part of learning. The ball goes into the net. It's like, you know, I've got I to gotta change. I don't need somebody next to me going, D minus F, by the way. The net tells me enough. <laughs> but then finally, reflection. I've got to realize that the thing I'm holding is not a car key. I've got to rethink my assumptions, what I already know. So a different way to think about learning. It also turns out that your brain, surprise, lives in your body. We've been ignoring this. We think of the brain as a computer. The brain is not like a computer. It's a little bit like a closet that you can reorganize when you get new information, and you have a little tiny flashlight that you're allowed to, you can only shine it at one thing at a time. That's more what your brain is like. It's not like a computer, you're not hardwired. It lives in your brain. So what happens when you get emotional? Your palms start to sweat, you're nervous about this. That changes the way that you think. So sleep, water, exercise, eating, and time end up being the most important conditions for learning. You get seven hours of sleep, what you remember from math class changes, right? You mostly remember emotions if you get seven hours. You remember how you felt in math class. And during the last hour, you get most of your REM sleep and you de-emotionalize your memories. Now, if you get eight hours of sleep, you might remember a little more content. Lack of sleep, seven hours, also raises your anxiety levels and makes you less able to distinguish between the I want to help you face and I'm gonna kill you face. Think about how that might be useful to your math teacher. It's like, I'm trying to help you. No, you're not! I got seven hours of sleep! So sleep turns out to be a key condition. Water in the morning, I'm sorry, not your coffee, because your brain is dehydrated, and so coffee is a diuretic. So water in the morning actually improves student performance. Starting class later in the day also helps. But also, ultimately, tea and sweet is not for teaching. It's for time. The one who does the work gets the benefit, right? Watching somebody else do push-ups. <laughs> not that useful. <laughs> Even if they're intellectual push-ups, the person who does the push-ups 
gets the benefit. So teaching is really a design problem. It's how do I design a system so that you will do the work? So if you're still given those algebra problems with the trains leaving the station going 30 miles an hour and the next train leaves the station going 20, right? Nobody cares about trains. It's not motivating. I don't want to do that. Right? But suppose I have different problem sets. Problem sets for the people who like law or engineering or for the football team. It's like, so the wide receiver you're covering can run 30 miles an hour. You can only run 20 miles an hour. How far back do you have to stand so he doesn't score a touchdown? That's the same problem. But I have designed a problem that's more motivating. That's exactly what a fitness coach does. Right? The first question I ask is, why are you here? Right? Because the gym is intimidating for me because you like the gym too much. You're a fitness instructor. You're trying to turn your arms into legs. It's all weird to me. <laughs> That's the way we look to students. When I think, they think, you like school so much, you're still here. <laughs> you like the library too much. I just want to visit. I don't want to move in. Right? So the motivational problem teachers, we tended not to have. But for students, this is what matters, the design problem. What do you already know about my subject? Does the word math scare you, right? Then I've got to build in lots of recall, lots of practice, lots of hitting the ball, tennis nets, motivation. When do I add the complication? So that's what teaching is. It's a design problem designed to get you to do the work. So content still matters. There has to be content. But I'm mostly trying to teach you how to do this thing so that you can learn how to change yourself without me. Turns out this is also true of college residential life. So these are dorms that we build. These are the first nudge dorms, or one of the first nudge dorms in the country. And they were designed to help build relationships, to help build community. Because the biggest problem in college, the number one reason students leave the first year, loneliness. I don't fit in, I don't have enough friends. Because this is the first time in history that freshmen arrive on a college campus with all of their high school friends with them on their phone, right? They're Facebooking and talking to their high school. I didn't talk to my high school friends in college. That was what the pay phone was for, but we didn't actually use it for that, right? So these dorms were built <coughs> with smaller rooms, bigger lounges, a kitchen on every floor, my best idea of all time. Faster Wi-Fi in the lounges. I slowed the Wi-Fi down in the dorms, get them out of their rooms, their GPAs went up. So thinking about all of the education as a design problem helps. So in the future, with new technology, our world has changed. Thinking actually got more important, not acquisition of content, because your phone's actually better at that. It'll remember more numbers than you can ever remember. But the thinking, the analyzing, that's actually gone up in value. Design has just gotten more important. It's not go to college because there'll be somebody there who knows more than you and they can talk about it. You can get that on your phone. There are plenty of lectures there. So integration matters. Why would we spend all this money to build parking lots and dorms if we're not going to integrate all of those experiences? So it's time to rethink the name professor, which implies that learning is about content. But teachers also are curators, motivators, designers. They do all of this role models. I'm watching you think. So just like you pick a fitness coach, don't pick the one who has the biggest muscles. Pick the one who makes you sweat the most. The same is true for a teacher. I don't want the one with the Nobel Prize. I want a cognitive coach, the one who makes me intellectually sweat the most. So teaching is about change, and being a teacher is one of the hardest things to do, to model for students what being a smart person looks like, because that means the ability to change your mind. Thank you. Thank you.